Good morning. Good morning. Good. How are you? Thank you. Just the three of us? So far, I oh, I see Swen. I'm going to let him in. Do you want to, um, right now you're showing as me, just because we're all using my link. If okay. you can uh, just update your name, please. Yeah. And I'm going to let a few more in. All right. Swen? Hi, guys. Hi. Two seconds. I'll be right with you. No problem. Thanks. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Good, good. I'm just letting a few more people in before I let everybody else in. Sounds good. Okay. Do you need to do a sound check or we're, just, we're pretty good, right? We're good, yeah, you sound great. Awesome. Oh, that is not, oh, there's Hanan, okay. Hi, Hanan. Hi, sorry, it asked, it prompted me to register. I'm not sure, that's why I'm a little. That's for contact tracing. Yeah, I thought <laughs> I was registered, but it's okay. Hello. Hello. Hi, Hi. Swan, nice to see you. Hi, Natasha, how are you? Hi. Good, how are you? Hi, Good. Hanan. Hello, how are you? Good, good. Good morning. Good morning. So when uh, Anne sends her regrets that she can't join us today, she is teaching a special needs class. Um, just oh, wow. Okay. Time. Yeah, yeah. So she That's just wants awesome. us to pass that information over to you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, to everybody who is currently on, if you could please just uh, do a check on the name that's showing for your panel because I think everyone is showing as me currently. So just uh, update that, please, before the meeting. Okay, here's Jake. There's a good looking crowd. Hi, Stephen. Good morning. Hi, Stephen. How are you? I'm doing okay. Stephen, I'm just going to do it. Even yeah, I'm gonna update board. them as board they come. Hey, ladies, are you in the um, in the lighthouse? Yes. Today? Yeah. Okay. And do you still have a supply of poppies? Yes. All right. If uh, if all is good after this, I'm gonna pop down and uh, and and buy a bunch. Oh, Please. awesome. Uh, yes. we, we also have two boxes. So if anybody needs an extra box, please by all means. Yeah. And did, did you hear what happened overnight? Um, no. Some complete jerk uh, went and stole a poppy box out of a store, and it was found uh, in an alleyway just behind Lakeshore. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Yeah. What Every is year. the purpose? Yeah, absolutely crazy. So it's 1131. I'm going to start letting people into the waiting room. I mean, into, into the meeting. So we, because mm -hmm. we do, we're working with a short uh, time here. Is Please. everybody Tasha, ready? It's, I just want to flag. So Sven had, like, we have to drop off the call at uh, 1230. So yep. it's, it's yep. uh, we're going to, we're running on time, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So oh that's why God. I'm letting everybody in right now. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Hi, everyone. Thank <laughs> you. 
<clears throat> Hello, everyone. Hello. Ready to rock and roll? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for um, joining us today. I know uh, everyone uh, has a very busy schedule. Um, we'd, uh, we're going to jump right in this because our time is limited um, and uh, we only have one hour. So we want to give an update on the side of the BIA as well as uh, uh, having the, uh, our members to be able to ask any questions directly to the councillor or to our uh, MP. <coughs> I'd like to introduce today who's going to be uh, speaking as the uh, uh, on today's uh, town hall. Um, first, we have um, myself, Jake Pedler, the chair of the Port Credit BIA. And um, I'd like to also introduce one of our speakers to give an update will be our operations manager, Natasha McKinnon, as well as our business development manager, Diane Dela Cruz. We also have with us our local MP member of Parliament, Sven Spigman. And our councillor, Steve Daskos, uh, will be given an update in regards to the city and the uh, Ward 1. As well as we have John Pappas, who is a member of the uh, BIA Board of Directors. And John is also the owner of um, the Crooked Q. His family also owns a Crooked Q in Toronto. And John has been instrumental in uh, crafting our uh, advocate, uh, advocating points that we are trying to um, uh, kind of bring light to all three levels of government uh, during this dire time. Thank you. Okay. Today we're so, gonna, go ahead. Sorry. So we're going to start out with our agenda. So the topics that we're going to cover is an uh, update from Jake Pudler, our chair. And we're going to move into a port credit BIA update for myself, Natasha McKinnon as well as Diane De La Cruz. Moving into a city update from Stephen Basco. And of course, John Pappas is going to give us an update for advocating for our Fort Credit BIA members. And following a federal update from Swen Spegman. And finally, opening up the floor to any questions any of our Fort Credit BIA members have. So just some quick housekeeping before we get started. Please be mindful and ensure that your microphones remain muted until it is your turn to speak. And as Natasha mentioned, we will be opening up the floor to all of our members today. So please hold all your questions until the end of the presentation. And uh, the attendees will be called on one by one and given the opportunity to share. Uh, and lastly, let's please all be respectful um, of everyone on this call. What can we do in times of uncertainty? We stay strong. Together. We support. We create. And we adapt. Port Credit Main Street is, is a, community. a community. Local places to gather. We are your community's small businesses. Telling our story of resilience and pride. We are business owners. Job makers. Entrepreneurs. The signs on our shop doors invite you into our dreams. The ones that we built from scratch. Behind each business is a face. A family. This is our story. This. 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 This is Port Credit. Businesses are people. People who need your support now. More, more than, than ever. ever. Thank you uh, for playing that. And, and, and a little shout out goes to Alex and, and Kevin for, for uh, uh, the BIA. We've hired them to create that, that video um, during our campaign, which we'll, we'll get into a highlight of businesses or people uh, after uh, in, in a few minutes here. But it's been three weeks since our last uh, town hall meeting with uh, MPP Rudy Cusetta and Councillor Daskos. That, town hall was well received and gave us a chance to see a few more people behind the businesses. 
the 477 businesses make up the Port Credit BIA boundary. There's seven volunteer board members and we have three paid staff. But that 477 number is definitely shrinking. The sheer frustration that I felt during this time was magnified tenfold hearing the stories and struggles from our valued members on the last town hall. Since that last meeting, more restrictions have been imposed due to the increase in numbers. However, those following statistics do not show that bars, restaurants, gyms are the issue. We are grateful the mayor spoke up, the mayor of Brampton, and had the courage to speak to the fact that restaurants, bars, and gyms are not driving the numbers up, but rather industrial settings, schools, and grocery chains. Friday was a punch in the gut twice when restaurants stockpiled for the weekend and suddenly told that only 10 people limit and a nine o'clock shutdown would be imposed. If that wasn't enough. Four hours later, the region came out with a set of even more severe restrictions thus kicking our businesses when they were down. <clears throat> In fact, the types of businesses that I described earlier that have the most severe restrictions have acted responsibly and have incurred huge costs to implement the systems to keep patrons and staff safe. The business owners can attest that with these earlier curfews even, Patrons are leaving to go to an unsecure residence or alternative place to socialize. And there's no systems in those underground places or residences. Another very important point that Louis from Cabin brought up at, at last town hall. And he stated clearly that just because the businesses are open does not mean they are not struggling because of COVID. The trickle down effect we heard with staffing and other associates in regards to the, the independent businesses is something that has to be kept in mind as well. The general feeling is giving businesses the ability to open just a little bit will allow the government or levels of government saying, well, you're open, so you do not need sufficient funding. Actions speak louder than words. And so far, we haven't even really too, heard too many words and the actions have been void. Right now, our businesses are on life support, a lot of them. And with this latest shutdown a month ago, we have still not received any kind of funding. I know these things take time, but we really need all three levels of governments to roll up their sleeves and do everything possible to get some funding to our businesses. How the businesses have been able to pay rent for October, November, December, coming up is for through their family, friends, mortgages. The revenues aren't there. We do not feel we are all in this together. And the reason why, we've all taken the path of being entrepreneurs. <clears throat> and politicians, government workers keep getting paid. They do not suddenly have to face a mountain of debt or the undaunting task of having to lay off staff members who are like family. So right now our people are dying a slow death of debt, despair and uncertainty and darkness. We need all hands on deck. If the government's gonna impose these extremely severe restrictions at least they can do is give funding. We're not getting either. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Jake. Okay, so moving forward, we're going to touch on a little bit more information about Support the Port. So uh, right now we are working on the website uh, with our web developers to discuss potential updates and functionalities to transform it into a Support the Port information hub. So we intend to utilize this platform uh, for basically as a umbrella. Uh, to host the uh, support the port gift cards. Again, for credit BIA members, if you are not signed up uh, for this uh, initiative for, to receive these gift cards, I do uh, ask you to kindly email me, Natasha at portcredit.com. Diane's gonna drop my email in the link, um, in the chat box there. Um, and we'll get you signed up and we'll, we'll give you some more information about what it is uh, we, uh, there, just another note that there is no cost to your business at all to sign up to receive these gift cards. Uh, to date, we have had two, $22,520 in purchase gift cards, uh, and there is unspent funds of 15600 Just something to note. Um, thank you. Uh, so everybody saw the beautiful video that Kevin and Alex uh, had put together, new members of our um, BIA. And um, we launched this campaign last Thursday, November 5th, uh, to raise awareness for our small businesses who are being impacted, uh, impacted by COVID-19 and to show the difficult reality that that business owners are facing today. Um, we, the primary reason is to get community support uh, from local, local and government by reminding them that behind every small business, there are people who need help right now. So um, a little bit more information for businesses are people. Uh, this, campaign, this campaign is also um, launched all over our social media and we have posted the video on all platforms and invested in paid social media ads to increase our video reach. So far we have reached 11,000 uh, 11, people who have viewed this. Um, and that is just from Facebook. Uh, when we get the analytics from YouTube as well as um, Instagram, we have reached a total of 12,300. So these numbers keep going up and uh, we are definitely on the road to creating the impact that we want. Um, moving into uh, some more advertisements on our digital city and Fram ad boards. So here's a list of every everywhere that we currently have the um, ads placed. So um, a few more pieces to our marketing campaign. We've secured a full bus wrap that is three-sided and it will feature um, the 24 images and photos of the business owners who had participated participated in this campaign. That bus will launch November 23rd and it will be out on the streets for uh, 12 weeks. We have also secured five large curb X signs at the following intersections. So as you're driving around Mississauga and into Poor Credit, you will see our poster very large, businesses are people. We will also be uh, printing and handing out posters for all of our business owners. Next week, we will have our street ambassadors hitting the ground and handing out posters to each of our members to put in their storefront. And we are also working on securing a storefront window space to display a floor to ceiling advertising in the middle of our village. We will also be rolling out a social media campaign. So keep an eye out on our Instagram and Facebook. And these will highlight the particip participating businesses in our campaign, as well as interviews and their personal experiences during COVID-19. And I'm sure that some of you may have already seen the Insaga article that was released last week. So we do have a par ongoing partnership with them 
And in addition to the article and the social media post, we will be rolling out a video for businesses, our people and supporting the port in the upcoming weeks, as well as a social media contest that will tie in our support the port gift cards. Thank you, Diane. Okay, so now we have an update from our Ward 1 Councillor, Mr. Stephen Dasko. The floor is yours. Hi, everyone. You know, I'm not going to give a long, uh, long winded uh, introduction or anything like that or an update, uh, just because I think most importantly is uh, hearing from everybody is, is the most important thing. Uh, I recognize not everybody, but a lot of people that are on the call now were on the call a, a few weeks back when uh, MVP uh, Cazetto was on as well um, and, and with myself. So I won't do that. I will. Uh, I will say that um, <clears throat> I guess a few things. Um, the um, tomorrow uh, during council, I will be bringing. Well, I, I will be supporting. Uh, last time I brought forward an extension to the patio program, which uh, which I, uh, I I've been pushing for. Uh, for us to not have to pay fees on them and things like that for our, our restaurants and bars, especially in the cultural note. Um, uh, push to get that to November 15th. And uh, that is now going to go right out to the end of this calendar year. Um, so that is uh, that report is uh, is coming up tomorrow. Uh, into uh, into council. And, um, and as well, I wanted to, uh, uh, to make mention uh, it's not coming up tomorrow, I believe it's the week after, uh, that I am advocating and pushing for uh, also to have free parking along the Lakeshore Corridor uh, for the BIA boundaries from November 26th to January 15th. So that'll just be a little bit longer than uh, than the normal uh, period or what's become the normal period. So looking to do uh, some things like that. Uh, and then as well, uh, I have been uh, pushing back with uh, with Dr. Lowe and um, and and other folks um, advocating the fact that uh, seeing the, case, the the daily case counts go up. I think we can all see that. You just turn on a, a television set; it doesn't. Uh, we can all see it. But uh, I think the frustration here is uh, when you look at where uh, where transmissions are coming from um, or seem to be coming from. Uh, our uh, our small businesses, especially on the uh, on the restaurant and bar side, is not where they're uh, where they're emanating from, uh, and everybody is getting punished for it. Especially now that the weather is starting to turn. I mean, we're blessed with uh, a few extra days of nice weather, but that is not going to uh, continue on uh, that much longer. Uh, and so, recognizing that uh, that this really does need to be addressed, and that uh, you know my my belief, and I'm going to be bringing this up again on Thursday at council. Uh, this is at the region with Dr. Lowe, is um, if they're looking to take uh, a bazooka out uh, for, uh, for trying to get numbers under control, aim it in the right place. And uh, I don't think uh, the strategy that they've done so far is, uh, is one that is, uh, is effective and well thought out. So I'm gonna be bringing that forward on Thursday. <clears throat> Again, I wanna turn it over to everybody here uh, to hear what you have to say and uh, and I'm, I'm uh, and also uh, please let me know what other questions uh, I can bring forward to dr. Lowe uh, keep in mind I am uh, I'm, I'm kind of at the at the bottom rung where I'm the facilitator of, of certain things and uh, and I'm I just want to bring forward what everybody has so those are my comments for for now thank you so much Stephen and now I'm going to introduce John Pappas. Yeah, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Um, let's get right into it. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. So um, we're going to start with a little bit of good news, actually. Um, the new rent subsidy is coming. And um, let's look at the chart. This is basically what the new supports are going to be. Um, but there is a column missing on the left. So where you see where it says 65% rate uh, base rent subsidy, that's for uh, if your business has lost more than 70% of your revenue. So if your business has lost more than 70% of your revenue, your, um, uh, your base rent subsidy will be 65% plus lockdown support, and you'll get a total rent subsidy of 90%, which is really good. 
Um, so the next tier down for 40%, as you see there, um, that column is for revenue loss of 50 to 69%. So basically there's a calculator there. So you'll get anywhere from 40% to 65% uh, uh, rent subsidy in, in that column. Now, if, you're, if your revenue drop is between one and 49%, the bottom, the bottom row, uh, your rent subsidy will be at least 25%, and then it'll get a multiplier of 0.8 times your revenue drop. So I hope that's clear. Um, if you need more information on that, uh, please uh, you know, check it out online. So overall, uh, we can say that the rent subsidy seems to be really improved, and uh, apparently it's gonna be easier to apply for, and apparently it's going to be given to uh, tenants, not landlords. So hopefully um, that'll uh, fix the problems with the pre previous rent subsidy. Um, and also to note on the second bullet point, eligible expenses for a location for a qualifying period would include commercial rent, property taxes, property insurance, and interest on commercial mortgages. This is very welcome news because, you know, um, the rent isn't the only expense that we incur as a business. And I guess our... Um, our major comment to this is like, when is it gonna start, right? Uh, rent subsidy ended at the end of September and it's not an excuse to say, oh, we didn't know a second wave was coming. That's not an excuse. So we need this done now <clears throat> and we need to support now. Um, the other question for me is uh, what is lockdown support? You know, um, are we in a lockdown right now? I think we are. So I, I'm hoping that we qualify for that support automatic. Okay, can we go to the next next slide, please? Okay, this is a personal issue for me. It hasn't been brought up by anybody else as far as I know. Uh, bank loan payments. I'm sure you're all in the same situation as we are. You know, you've got a mortgage on your house. You've got a mortgage on your business or, you know, mortgage on the building that you own, commercial loans, uh, personal loans. Uh, in March, banks were automatically uh, giving anyone who asked for it a six-month deferral of bank payments. Uh, whether it's a personal loan or a commercial loan. So it is beyond my comprehension why that program has stopped. Like we're almost worse off now than we were before. And for some reason, our banks, and I'll call it out, RBC and CIBC are unwilling to give us any sub, to give us another round of deferrals. It's not like they were even going to lose money, right? They were just compounding the interest and piling it on top of your debt. So um, I, we have uh, lobbied uh, Sven's office uh, about a month ago to look into this. Look into this. They've talked to the Ministry of Finance, and um, we look forward to uh, Sven's response as to where we are with that issue. Um, we figure that the federal government could, the least they can do is write legislation um, to force the banks to give us more deferrals. I mean. This is a no-brainer to me. It would be very easy to do, and I'm shocked that it hasn't been done yet. The okay, next slide, please. Okay, CPP and EI. Um, I'm not sure that the uh, government knows, but we, um, under the old subsidies um, with wages, that um, whatever your percentage wage subsidy was down was given. Uh, that portion of CPP and EI was also taken off. But that is now changed. So no matter what our wage subsidy is, uh, we are still responsible for 100% of paying CPP and EI. We think this is unfair. And uh, least they could do is restore it back to the original. Okay, next slide. Okay, grants. Um, we find uh, generally that grants have been incredibly lacking. Uh, we keep hearing about deferrals. Deferrals don't do us any good. It makes it actually the situation worse for us. Uh, there was a, um, uh, a loan program called SIBA. It's around 40 to 60,000 per business if you qualify. And uh, it's a one size fits solution, one size all fits solution, but it doesn't really re reflect the scale of your business. So, you know, for my business, that's a bit more on the medium scale, you know, and you know, our revenues are down in the millions and you give us a loan for 40,000, doesn't go very far. Um, and then if your business is a bit bigger than mine and your say your payroll is over one and a half million, you actually don't even qualify for this loan. So like our question is, why do you, why do, why do you have caps? Why do you have limits? And, you know, 
40 grand might be good for smaller businesses, but it's certainly not good to once you get into the medium size. And, and let's be honest, it's the medium sized businesses that employ the most people. And if we want to get everybody back working again, uh, we better protect all businesses, right? So we want everybody getting back to work. So what we want to know is what other grants are available to us, um, what other grants are being considered, and we need grants, not deferrals. And, uh, you know, we need help covering our many other, all these incidental and extra costs of like uh, covering loss of stock and that sort of thing. Um, and I, I'm suggesting, uh, you know, maybe a grant for reopening once the restrictions are done so that we can get back on our feet quicker. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, this is something that we added at the end. Um, we want to know what the plan is for vaccinations because ultimately, without a, a vaccination and, uh, and, and developing a herd immunity with our, with our society, um, being in our business, we always seem to be first to close and last to open. So we think it is extremely important that we understand that the first people getting the vaccine will be the frontline workers and most vulnerable persons. But, you know, we want the government to make sure that the next vaccines will be available to uh, the regions that are most uh, hard hit by the virus, i.e. Toronto, Peel, and Ottawa. So we, we were advocating for priority when it comes to vaccinations. Okay, let's get back. Um, um, and this is probably the most uh, difficult slide and uh, most important. Okay, so the wage subsidy, as you all know, has changed and it's gotten considerably worse. Not that the last one was even great, all right? So if you look at the uh, chart there and you see the revenue decline, um, if, you're, if your revenue decline is 70% or greater, your wage subsidy is only 65%, and then it's on a sliding scale downwards from there. Um, this is unacceptable. I mean, nobody who has a revenue drop of 50% of their business can afford to pay anything to employees. So at, at least under the old program, the government cut, uh, covered up to 75% of the wage, but it was the first 75% of the wage. So when we actually got open after the first lockdown, we were able to call back all of our staff because we could at least give them some money. And then we were, had a little bit of a chance to recover from uh, you know the hundreds of thousands of dollars that we lost. So we're advocating that the government at least go back to the old program, which was way better. And then there's some other points in there. So if you scroll down a little bit there, you'll notice that the, um, the wage subsidy, yeah. But there's a, there's, yeah, let's go to the next slide. So it, it gives you an, an example of how the wage subsidy works. So you fill in the boxes and it tells you how much your wage subsidy is. So we just put in some numbers that might be typical of a, of a business, and you look like the wage subsidy is only 40%, even though the revenue drop for the business is 50%. If you look at the next slide, um, the wage subsidy, um, uh, you don't even get any top up under that condition. So this actually happened to us, right? So um, we did okay in the summer, we had a patio, but as revenues decline going into the fall, um, the wage subsidy doesn't catch up because they, they do it on a rolling three month period. And those rolling three months are on higher revenues in the previous months. Okay, so you're actually kind of getting screwed here. So you, you end up with falling revenues and declining wage subsidy. So this has to be reversed and addressed. Okay, next slide. All right, we have some takeaways. All right, the wage subsidy is decreasing. So we're asking that they at least uh, resort to the old system. And we need to make back some of the losses that we are incurring. Um, the other takeaway is that there's a, a, a maximum to the wage subsidy. The maximum to the old wage set subsidy was I believe $847 a week, which is piddly. And now it's only $735 a week. Uh, this maximum needs to be increased drastically. It has to reflect reality. So like, let's call it what it is. I mean, would any government worker accept this? I don't think so. 
you know, um, I would challenge the government to make that wage, make that CRV, and then we'd see real yelling and screaming. It wouldn't happen. Um, okay. So I'm going to finish up with a, a, a few personal statements. And I'll try to hold it together. <clears throat> We're sick and tired of being blamed. Okay, we're scapegoated. We're not the problem, and we're being hammered the most. When our politicians are on the record saying that we've had zero cases of transfer COVID, and that you get shut down, it's terrible, it's devastating. We're professionals. We keep people safe. You're safer at our business than you're at your house. So stop treating us like that. Has to end now. And if you insist on doing that, support us. It's cruel. And let's face reality, cases are going up. We're probably one hair closer to lockdown totally. And the numbers have to get below like 100 cases per day in Ontario before they're going to open us up again. So we're really looking at at least six months of this. It's going to get worse. We need the supports now. We need proper supports. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Swen, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Natasha. And uh, thank you to, to Jake and to the board of the BIA for, for having me here. Um, thank you, all of you. And, and John in particular, uh, given his most recent comments for, for your leadership and for your advocacy and for not being shy about bringing out the emotional component of this pandemic. Um, before I start, I just wanted to take a moment to pass to each of you my condolences on the passing of Beatrice. Um, I know there are deep longstanding friendships in our community um, with her and our entire team speaking for, for my office. Um, is going to miss her profoundly. So I just wanted to share that with you this morning and thank her for her vision and, and her lifetime of service to our community. Um, on a more cheerful note, I would like to introduce uh, a core member of my team, Hanan Harap, who's on the call with us. Hanan represents a team of five of us that are looking after you during the pandemic and they've all been working tirelessly since the spring listening and advocating. And I think especially in light of what was just said I think it's very, very important for your elected leaders to pledge to listen, not necessarily to reply with their answer, but first of all, to understand and to understand not only the numbers, but also the human uh, and, and mental pressures that this pandemic is creating for us and for people right around the world. Um, in terms of uh, the, the global geometry of this crisis, there, there's a massive emergency response underway um, that extends to every G7, G20, G77 country facing very similar challenges. The global economy is impacted. It's important for all of us to steer uh, the course collectively. Locally, I think it's very important that we look after the most vulnerable individuals, but also the most vulnerable segments of our business community, as was already pointed out in earlier comments. Um, that's our reflex. If we keep the most vulnerable strong, the rest of us will be uh, strong enough to, to see this through. Um, and we're doing that in so many ways, and, and many of those ways are heartwarming. Um, again, it's not just about numbers and economics, but it's about the impact on, of this pandemic on us as human beings. So mental wellness is a core component of keeping each other strong, coming together, supporting each other economically in terms of our business relationships, but also person to person. Um, both with respect to healthcare and the business side. And there are literally lifetimes of energy and passion that are, that are reflected and represented in small businesses right across um, our province and our country. 
it's crucial that all levels of government work in sync. And I think in large part, we're seeing that that's the case. Uh, in this particular case of the second wave, and again, comments earlier, we're going in that direction. We have local decisions with respect to pandemic response that are then supported by really massive federal investments. Um, the initial COVID response uh, transferred $19 billion from the federal government to the provinces. Seven billion of that went to the province of Ontario. And it's equally important, as Stephen has mentioned, that we support our cities as well. Uh, we've got a very strong relationship between the mayor of Mississauga and the federal government and among the big city mayors, uh, collectively very strong relationships. Um, there's also an important organization in our midst, and I wanted to just flag it with you. I don't know if Kay Matthews is on the line, but we have the OBIAA, which is the Ontario Business uh, Improvement Area Association. It's the umbrella group. Um, we've reached out from the federal level to get a sharper picture of uh, what small businesses across the province are feeling. And poor credit is very much part of that. So I just put that to you as, as a vehicle for uh, amplifying the very effective advocacy that John has put forward. If, if the uh, OBIA found a way to put itself behind the most important points, they would be infinitely easier to, to advocate, to understand, and to, to push into place uh, to, those extent, to the extent that they're not already moving forward as, as John has framed them and would like them the OBIA may be a vehicle for you to, to work with. Um, another important thing, and I don't wanna get partisan political by any stretch, but at a political level, it's also important that you hear, uh, that we hear from you, um, an overall message of support for the pandemic response. Yes, it's incredibly important to make sure that we keep our credits in particular and its businesses uh, strong and funded and supported. But there's a bigger picture which extends to the pandemic response with respect to healthcare, with respect to the global economy, larger businesses, uh, the not-for-profit sector. So if you can put your weight behind uh, those aspects of what you think is, is right in terms of what we're currently doing, that would help us to keep going and to navigate through the end of the pandemic, however long that's going to take. So that's really our commitment is to continue to invest in Canadians and in Canada for as long as it takes to get through this. Um, but we need your support politically for that as well. Um, let me just very briefly, before turning it over to, to questions and, and views from members, uh, go through the core programs that John has touched upon uh, to some extent in much greater detail than, than I will right now. Um, the three core programs are the Canadian uh, Canada Emergency Rent Subsidy, um, which is to provide simple, easy to access commercial rent support directly to tenants. As John was saying, that's the big shift. Instead of going through the banks and landlords, we're going directly to tenants. Uh, importantly, mortgage interest is included. That'll be of interest to a number of you uh, within the community of the Port Credit BIA. Um, with respect to lockdown support, um, this is really recognizing exactly what uh, Jake was saying earlier. When the province or the region makes a decision to go into lockdown or to curtail uh, business activity, the federal government has pledged to provide support. Um, and that's an additional 25% uh, to businesses that have temporarily shut down due to mandated public health orders. So that could, uh, for some businesses, uh, raise the, uh, the rent subsidy up to 90%. Um, the last component in that is the emergency wage subsidy and its extension until June, 2021. And mindful of what John said should happen with respect to augmentation of that program. This entire package of legislation is currently before the Senate. So we don't have the details yet. When we get them, I would suggest that we line them up, John, against your submission to see what was answered. And to the extent that it wasn't answered, to turn your uh, presentation into something that will go directly to the federal government. I had an hour-long uh, conversation with Martina Alzi just a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, in the course of which I took her comments and relayed them directly to the Minister of Finance. I thought they were significant enough and encapsulated um, the, the sort of median business in poor credit uh, that the minister needed to hear this directly. And she replied and was grateful for that advocacy. It's exactly that kind of initiative that needs to happen for government to understand um, the, the predicament of having to navigate these programs, but also where the gaps are that we think maybe address that uh, to the satisfaction of the community, but it's not actually the case, right? So this kind of exercise is incredibly helpful. It's really happened since March, but now that we're in the second wave, we need to hear from you with, with even greater clarity and amplification where the remaining gaps are. Keeping in mind that this is uh, a program that takes us through the pandemic to keep businesses as mobile and as warm as possible. Uh, in full anticipation that at, at one point we will get past this and we're out of the pandemic and then going into full recovery mode. And that's why we want people to stay on payroll. That's why we want businesses to stay open uh, and to continue to maintain their premises. 
With respect to SIBA, the, the business account, uh, we've increased that by an additional 20,000. It's gone up from 40,000 to 60,000 for the smaller businesses for whom that kind of loan order of magnitude would make a difference. And very importantly, it's now been made eligible to uh, organizations that run personal bank accounts, um, which wasn't the case in the beginning. We heard very loud and clear from uh, that segment of the business community, particularly the smaller ones that were focused on, on the arts and, and other less revenue heavy um, segments that it would be important to open it up to uh, entrepreneurs who are running personal accounts rather than corporate accounts. There are a number of other programs. Um, John, I think you mentioned you need to know what's out there in terms of grants and reliefs and programs. There's the Regional Relief and Recovery Fund that's got $1.5 billion in it uh, to help as businesses and organizations in manufacturing, technology, tourism, and others uh, that are key to regions and local economies. So in some respects, it may well be of interest uh, to members of the BIA to talk to our office to see what the criteria are, what uh, what we could help with in terms of bringing an application if that hasn't already happened. There's also specific support for cultural heritage and sport organizations. Uh, it's a $500 million emergency support fund um, for uh, alleviation of financial pressures to, uh, of cultural heritage and sport organizations facing significant losses. And then we have targeted support. I mentioned earlier, um, looking out for those who are particularly vulnerable with respect to their position in the business community. Uh, young entrepreneurs, women, indigenous businesses, and Black-owned businesses and entrepreneurs uh, each have uh, targeted programs that we're very happy to, to share with you in more detail and to see if applications uh, can be brought successfully. Let me just close by uh, saying a little bit about the, the $7 billion that we transferred to Ontario, um, because in many respects, it's direct federal assistance that we discussed here, but it's also the provincial federal transfers um, that are important and the complementary between what the province is doing and what we're doing. Um, the federal government gave 0.2 billion to the COVID-19 response fund, 1.1 uh, billion to the essential workers wage top up, uh, 5.1 billion to the safe restart agreement and 0.8 billion to the safe return to school fund with respect to the province of Ontario alone. So the Ontario budgetary officer has just concluded that 97 cents for every dollar um, that the province has spent on COVID has come from the federal government. So I'll just conclude there just to let you know that we do have your back. It's been a massive investment, unprecedented in our country and in so many others. Uh, we need to steer the course. Um, letting it go off the rails early is going to serve absolutely no purpose because the, the pandemic rates are going to pop up again and people will be left more vulnerable than they were in the first place. So steering the course is important, your voice is important, and your overall political support for the conclusion that we simply have no other option than to invest, um, to saddle the taxpayer and the individual with the burden of going through this uh, pandemic uh, is simply not viable. The federal government and, and its counterparts are in a much better position to take on this burden. Yes, it's going to result in deficits and we have to figure out how to, how to pay them back ultimately, but it's the only way that we can stay strong enough to take us into a hopefully vibrant and, and speedy recovery once we're through the pandemic. I'll leave it there and um, back to you, Natasha, and hoping to get comments and questions. Thank you for that update, Swen. Uh, at this time, we are going to be opening up the floor to our businesses. Natasha will be calling on each of you one by one. Uh, please be mindful that there are many people who would like to share. So if, you, um, if your question has been asked or you don't wish to uh, share any comments, please just say pass and we'll move on. Thank you, Diane. Okay, so I'm gonna call on Arun Arora. Uh, the floor is yours if you have anything you'd like to ask. Okay, so we are gonna move on to Candice from Post. The floor is yours. Okay. Um, I would just, uh, being from the restaurant post, I totally understand what John's saying. I feel like we're being penalized. We're doing everything we can to keep people safe. And uh, we have no cases. We're not the driver of it. I think that sending people home at 10 o'clock to go drink privately is just making it worse. I think that it's we're being punished for doing a good job. And it's it makes no sense exactly what he said. I think it's it's a completely illogical approach to trying to control the numbers. I just, and it's, and yeah, we're wondering where's where's the rescue for us? 
<laughs> and all our employees. So we're in the same boat as John. That's my comment. I have no question because I'm just shaking my head. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Candice. Um, we're going to move on to Kara from the Cricket Queue. The floor is yours. Hi there. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm Kara. I am John's GM at the Cricket Queue. I just wanted to put a face to the employees that back all these owners. Um, Without this support, without supporting from the top and trickling down, uh, you're essentially going to be putting me out of a job and asking me to collect the same amount of money as our dishwasher. So our 16 year old dishwasher is capable of collecting up to $2,000 a month. And that's what you're expecting me to collect. I have a mortgage. I have two children who are in sports. I have a car payment. I've already dipped into my savings the first round. And now if you shut us down again with $2,000, you're gonna ask me to take away from my kid's education fund. So we have uh, our head chef is a single dad of three kids. His rent is more than the $2,000 you're expecting us to live off of. 2,000 is a lot to a kid who makes $150 a week. I get it. I'm not begrudging him his money but how dare you ask me to live off of that same amount? It's not fair. And we have worked tirelessly these past eight months to make, and I say our business, because I've been there 21 years and I've put my blood, sweat and tears alongside of John every single day to make sure that the business is safe. Uh, I have written with John and Matina policies and procedures. We have made sure we have proper PEE. We have hand sanitizer. We have spent thousands of dollars putting up plexiglass. We follow the rules to a T. You can walk into our restaurant and it's like John said, or somebody else said, Candace said, it's safer. We had three tables on Saturday night at nine o'clock who told me to my face, they were going home to continue their outing in their own home. So if they're in our business, we can control that they wear a mask to the bathroom, that they don't sit more than six at a table, that they're only there for you know X amount of time, that there's hand sanitizer. I could go on and on and on. Anyways, I'm just here to put a face to the people who are supporting these business owners. And it's detrimental that you get all of these um, support systems into place. Because honestly, if we go into another lockdown, I'm gonna lose my house. My kids are gonna lose their education fund. Our head chef's going to lose his rental property, his car that he needs to get to work. It's very important that you put these into place for us, for the business owners, and, and help us. Help us. We're drowning here. The business owners are drowning. The employees are drowning. And then you expect us through our, our, all this, you know, there's everyone suffering through mental health. I have to get up every day, send my kids to school, put a smile on my face and tell my employees, don't worry, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay when I don't know how I'm going to pay my next mortgage payment. So I just wanted to put a, a face to the employees that are backing all of these business owners. Thank you. Natasha, do, would you like us to come in and address or do we, do we just want to hear in sequence what everybody, I, there's some very good points there. Maybe we can circle back after everybody else has shared. Does, does yes. that work? Or? Yes, let's do that. I'm just being mindful to, of time. And then what we can do is just take notes of every of all the uh, comments and we can address them. Thank you. So I'm going to call out Danny. Uh, Danny from Indian Cuisine, the floor is yours. Okay, I'm going to call out Julia from the Studio Paint Bar. The floor is yours. Hey, thank you so much for all of the comments and everything you guys are all doing. It it really does help us. Where we at the studio feel really lost, um, especially with the new regulations that have come out as of Friday last week. I feel like we've replanned four times this week. I don't know what to tell my clients. Everyone's confused. So I really would love any direction or help as to how we are going to interpret Lawrence Lowe's last letter. I don't know if that means closure for us because I don't know if I'm allowed to operate. I don't know if um, you know we can continue our business and, and being restricted the way that we're being restricted, like no gatherings and all of this, like that's a huge detriment to my business as well. And I'm sure everyone else on the strip that does similar things to what I do. And in a time where 
people are so confused. They don't want to do online things anymore. Like this is just like a death knell for, for things like us. So <laughs> I would love some guidance and some help as to how to interpret the last, last letter from Lawrence Lowe. Thank you, Julia. Um, we are going to call Lucy, Zest for Living. Lucy, the floor is yours. Okay. We I, are, yeah. oh, sorry. Go ahead, go I ahead, just, I just wanted to thank um, you for putting this together and specifically to John and all the restaurant owners. I mean, I'm not a restaurant, but I feel just, I don't even know what how, how, to, how to describe it. When I talk to my kids about the responsibilities of those in power and how poorly this has been executed, um, I just wanted to let you know that, you know, as a small business, we're all, and, and someone else said this earlier, we're all in this together. We're not. Some are riding cruise ships and some barely have a paddle to keep afloat. And it's very clear that it's the, the gap is getting wider and wider. Um, just on one small note, and I don't know if um, the MPPs can speak to this, but when they close things down within eight hours for these restaurants and get gave three days notice to those in our surrounding area. How do, I mean, how do we explain that to our families? And then they did the same thing again this past weekend here. We're all excited that maybe we can go out and have a meal together. I'm a, we're a family of six. We're only allowed four of us at a table. And then suddenly they change it again. It's just, it's just so difficult to understand where these bits of information are coming from and nothing is consistent and the inconsistency for all of us is probably the most troubling. I know it's different, difficult for everyone to make a decision. There has to be some consistency and there has to be some direct answers to those that are suffering the most. So that's all I have to say today. Thanks. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, I believe I have Danny here. He was uh, just on mute, but he did have a comment. Danny? Yeah, sorry. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you to John and Jake. I mean, John, you guys are doing fantastic. And, uh, you know, my heart goes to everybody. It's it's pretty tough time. We just got to stick together. That's what I think it is. You know, that's pretty much I have to say, you know, please be safe. That's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you for that positive message, uh, Danny. I have uh, Wasim. From Clop Talk, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, I am going to call on Louis from the cabin. The floor is yours. Uh, many thanks, everybody. Um, appreciate all the comments and the dedication to helping us move this along. And most importantly, to have a forum to be able to ask questions and have our voices heard. Um, something that I didn't bring up last time is that, and I haven't told many people this at all, but um, not only is our poor credit location being hit with collateral damage that we spoke about, but of course our downtown locations as well, to the point where we were marketing um, free services. We gave out 16,000 direct mail coupons for people in our neighborhoods for us to support our neighbors during this time. And the premise was that we're all in this together. We're neighbors, we're helping neighbors. So please come and enjoy a complimentary haircut. And really that was twofold. One was to just let people know that we're still alive and trying our best. And the other one is to make sure that my team constantly had something to do because the, the decline in business is so significant that in most cases people would have uh, wrap this up, close the shops and moved on. Um, I might be a little crazy in thinking that there's a, there's a chance to be able to make this all happen. However, it's becoming increasingly difficult. And in saying that, looking at the review that John did for wage subsidy, here's where it falls apart. And I just want to make sure that this is heard so it can be brought back to all levels of our government and anybody that can make a difference. Because we're so uh, out of, we're, we're so slow in the downtown core, like we're doing one haircut a day. Uh, we're not selling any retail at all. It's, it's, um, it's a death wish for sure. Uh, and the nail in the coffin. We've had to move some of our, our barbers to other locations. Like we've brought two of them back to poor credit to simply 
keep them employed, um, doing everything we can to ensure that we still pay out our, our teams uh, and not have them go on assistance beyond us. The challenge there is, is that now the wage subsidy doesn't allow me to qualify because I'm not comparing apples to apples. If I'm looking at a 70% reduction, because I've brought in two other chairs from other locations, I in fact look like we're increasing our sales, but we've increased our costs significantly, not only from creating a station for all the PPE gear that's required for the maintenance and management of that station for the staff to be there. So that, that I'm, you know, minimizing my weight or my revenue by X amount isn't really a true reflection of what's really happening in this location. So now we're going to be at, you know, 30% coverage. We just can't afford to continue doing that. Like we've done it for so long. I've dipped personally into my accounts to be able to support my team where they need to be supported because I just refuse to give up. Um, and that could be crazy. Thank you. I remain hopeful and yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely looking out for everybody that we can help. And at the same time, I'm looking desperately for you guys to make the same effort um, on the levels of government that can make an influence and change here. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much. I have Jonathan Harvey, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, hey everybody, thanks for, uh, thanks for everything everyone said, especially John, I really appreciate it. It was very heartfelt. And I, a lot of us are feeling the same thing. Um, I think if we do not get the Canadian emergency rent subsidy and the SIBA loans out very soon, there will be an empty gesture. Um, it's very urgent for a lot of businesses. They may not make it through this month. Um, but now kind of onto the restaurants. So I own a few restaurants and, you know, um, Dasco is doing this extended patio thing, which sounds great. You know, the BIA is doing marketing programs, which are awesome. But um, unfortunately, they're all going to fall short if we do not get um, Bonnie Crombie and Dr. Dr. Lowe to change their tune. Because like, I don't know if everyone knows exactly what the restrictions are but there's no celebrating holidays or life events and business establishments. <clears throat> Bars and restaurants have to restrict seating to people that are from the same household. So you can't celebrate an event and you can't sit with your friends. So who the hell is gonna go to a restaurant? Like honestly, who's gonna be there, you know? Um, and I, I find it challenging that they continue to make this subjective. They go, okay, well, you can still have 50 people in churches. Now look, I have nothing against religion or churches or anything like that, but why is this virus subjective and 50 people can go to a church, but I can only have 10 in my restaurant. It makes literally no sense sense and i would love for them to stop making these decisions and it, it seems arbitrary you know like um if only two percent of restaurants are responsible for cases and we've been shut down for 28 days obviously we're not the problem you know so why why is this happening and why did we get blanketed in with brampton um it's it seems it seems a little bit outrageous and i just don't know like i'm just not even sure if the mayor has the like does she even have the authority to make these decisions to just shut us down like this um because it just seems careless it seems like she's got no experience in this field whatsoever and we're all really really suffering for it so um, yeah, I guess my takeaway really is um, for our, our MPP and for Dasco and for everybody just to um, you need you need to get you need to get Bonnie Crombie and Low to change their tune or don't even bother opening restaurants because we're not going to survive. There's just no point. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I do have uh, Matina. I know that we are out of time. Swen, um, are do you have a hard stop at this time? We're we're negotiating behind the scenes. To okay, get us thank a bit you. More time. Um, okay. I'd like to hear from Matina if she's here. I think yeah. you can go for another five minutes. I, yep. I yeah. Okay. okay. Perfect. So Thanks, Matina, Anna. and then I have Patricia that has her hand up. Matina, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you so much, Sven, um, and Stephen, for taking the time to listen to us. We really appreciate it, um, especially in a time where we feel like we have no voice, and that we really are the underdogs here. So, just in terms of two points. It's really the caps and the way the, the federal government uh, puts these programs together, which are amazing to help us, but there's no regional um, consideration for cost of living. So for example, Peel, a two bedroom apartment, the average rent is 2121 a month. Edmonton, it's 1247. And Truro, Nova Scotia, it's 850. So there's, there needs to be some sort of a regional approach, just like the virus, where the cost of living is taken into account. Second of all, um, we every time we lay people off, we lose people. So the first round of layoffs, only two of my staff didn't come back. I've just 
laid people off again last month. And then I brought them all back anticipating that we're open and five didn't come back. So every time we lay people off and there's a closure, we just keep losing more and more people. And eventually we're not going to actually have people to be able to reopen because they're going to leave the industry. Um, but really the main point for me is there needs to be regional aid, regional top up for places that are more expensive to live. Like our rents are higher, um, people's bills are higher because it's more expensive to live in some pl places in Canada. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Patricia, please, uh, the floor is yours. Hi, okay, thank you. Um, I'm similar in, to the uh, restaurant industry. I'm in the wedding industry, which has been also hit really, really badly. Um, so since venues are pretty much non-existent, uh, it has a big trickle effect on a lot of related businesses such as mine, which were a bridal store and poor credit. Um, I guess the thing that troubles me the most, and my question is, Every night when I'm at home and I watch the news religiously, both federal and provincial leaders keep saying that, quote, nobody will be left behind. And um, I certainly feel left behind. And I know thousands of other businesses, owners and employees of those businesses feel that way. Before this pandemic hit, governments around the world knew what a pandemic would cause in the world. There's many studies of this. When this pandemic hit and we were shut down, a second wave was known that it was going to happen and it was quoted that it was going to be worse than the first wave. My question is, why are all the subsidies and the efforts less for the second wave than they are for the first wave? Similar to many points that John has made, why is this wage subsidy less? Why is the, um, you know, it's harder to get any of these things now that we're in the second wave than they are in the first. And my concern with that is, let's just be honest, is the money running out so that we can plan accordingly? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Patricia. Swen, the, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, uh, Natasha. And thank you to, to everybody who made comments. Um, if, if you've got views that you haven't aired or that you'd like to amplify, please don't hesitate to get in touch directly with our team or uh, through Jake and the BIA, if you feel that it's a, a point that it, that's relevant to every business. Uh, Cara, very, very important points. In many ways, Matina and I, when, when she spoke, went through this because she advocated not just for the Crooked queue, but more passionately even for her team, um, recognizing how much time, how many years she had invested into building a team that was uh, incredibly um, homogeneous, loyal, well-functioning. Um, the points that you raised reflect that. Um, two things, showing how poor credit is safe you can do it by story. You can you can walk people through the restaurants and show the infrastructure changes that you've achieved. Um, hopefully, it can also be done through contact tracing, right? That's that's a big thing where the federal government is uh, now providing tests, rapid testing uh, to the province. Uh, if we can focus on contact tracing to sort of show that a particular section of a region is actually not um, a driver of COVID, that then more calibrated and more precise decisions can be made uh, to keep uh, subsections of a region open. At the moment, if the data is only captured at the regional level without any contact tracing uh, going on, then there's no way to actually say that, you know, poor credit within Peel region is safe. So that's, I think, a very important point. The, uh, the salary differential question is very important because it goes to fairness. It goes to consistency and fairness and, and unfair or even perceptions of unfair treatment uh, contribute greatly to exacerbating the impact of COVID. I was going to ask Kara if she has a solution in mind on how to do that, because then you get into questions of having to demonstrate how much income you make and getting a, a sort of tailored uh, relief amount that's commensurate with that. Uh, more expensive to generate administratively, probably a bigger, uh, more time consuming question, um, but potentially one that's relevant, especially if the pandemic is going to be here longer than we anticipated. It's a very different calculation to go through a six month pandemic or even a 12 month pandemic than it is to go through a two or three year pandemic where you have multiple seasonal cycles and only then exit from it. We don't know where we're gonna be yet. We're hearing news about a vaccine, but all optimism I think needs to be tempered with some caution. So Kara, maybe very quickly, if you have a, do you have a potential solution on how to address that? The chef, uh, the senior manager making multiple times what the dishwasher is making and how to be fair across a potentially longer uh, pandemic response. I don't 
have an answer to that, to that, to be honest. Um, keeping us open, keep it, keeping us open is, is, is the solution. Uh, fighting for us, fight, not pointing the fingers at us. The only right. way to keep us paid fairly is to keep us open and to allow us to run our business in the safe way we've been doing since 1997. This, yeah. isn't, this isn't new to us. Like being safe, having policies, procedures, protocols. Um, public health has been inspecting us since 1997, not since COVID started. So we've never had a green or a red mark against us um, as many of the establishments in poor credit. I think that the, the only way to support us fairly is to keep us open. Because like you said, I don't know how, how you could tier it. Um, you make this amount or, or do it percentage wise, or you know what? Like Matina said, no government official would live off of $2,000. If you laid your staff off, they'd get 100% of their salary. Pay us. Right. Pay us 100% right. of our salary. Right. I'll stay home. <laughs> but unfortunately, I can't. I, I, I can't do it. And neither can many. And, and I just would also like it to be known that, you know, it's a stigma in the restaurant industry that it's fully employed by students or younger, younger generation or younger uh, people. There are a lot of people my age, I won't disclose it, um, who are in the restaurant industry with families, mortgages, children, education funds that they need to save for. Um, I don't know. You need to keep us open. You need to give us a fair chance because right now we're drowning. We're yeah. drowning. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, just briefly touching on, on the other points that we raised. Some, some are about the decision on when to close, how to close. These are delegated to the province, to the region. But again, contact tracing, knowing what the COVID vectors are is incredibly important. That goes back to testing. Um, Louis, your point with respect to having multi, two or more businesses that sort of cross subsidize each other, you're rolling part of one business into another, uh, that's relevant. And maybe there's a way to capture that in the application process if it's one owner that's got uh, two or three branches. Uh, Martina and I spoke as well. There's some arbitrary treatment as John alluded to with respect to payroll, uh, one business just above 1.5, the other just below. Um, there's a fairness uh, and arbitrariness argument that can be made there. Um, Jonathan, your point on urgency, I will take that back. Uh, that's incredibly important to hear, and I will amplify that because uh, time is ticking furiously, especially this month. Um, and then with respect to um, uh, Diane's point on, on layoffs, uh, the whole program was engineered to keep relationships in place. As you can imagine, we wanted people to stay on payroll, uh, even at reduced wages, at reduced subsidies, uh, at reduced workloads simply because that would empower the business to maximize its uh, potential during the recovery. Everything is, gamed, is, is aimed at the recovery, right? Um, knowing that it will come, but not knowing when it will come. So when you have to do multiple rounds of layoffs and people aren't coming back to you, um, that erodes the very fabric on the basis of which we've built these uh, response programs. So that's a very important message to us. Um, if, if that happens and people are leaving the sector, then you're really left with, um, with a blank slate and in some ways we've invested money in a very bad outcome that uh, that's not the answer that we want right we want these investments to pay off to position you uh, to be able to recover well when when the recovery does come um i think that covers most of uh, the comments that came uh patricia with respect to weddings you're in the vulnerable sector um it, there, there is a regional relief and recovery fund maybe we should have a conversation with my team on that because there are sectors that are disproportionately impacted tourism aviation um anything with respect to event pl event planning hospitality of course as well um we'll have a conversation with you if you'd like to see if there are additional levers that we can we can activate for you to to provide support and that goes for everybody else as well i just want to uh, conclude by saying that um it's uh, you should be very very proud of your leadership You've got an incredible board. They're very effective. They've done their homework. If you advocate like this, changes will happen, and they have happened as, result, as a result of the advocacy by members of the BIA and the organization um, right across the province as well. So uh, please keep pushing us. Um, keep giving us your views, not just the numbers, but the human story, the human element. The, the most effective way to get an elected official to move is to show her or him the impact uh, on human beings. Um, and you're doing that. So, so I thank you for that. Jake, um, we're in your hands with respect to future follow-up and interaction. Maybe we can run this kind of a format again in a couple of months once the legislation has gone through and we've got the details on the next phase of programs that we've put into place maybe early next year. And in the meantime, if there are any urgent questions by members of the BIA with respect to eligibility, uh, loan approvals, anything of that nature, please don't hesitate to reach out to my team.
Thank you, Swa Thank you uh, Ben. We've got a bunch of uh, comments in the uh, comment section. What I'm gonna do is flag them all and uh, I'm gonna address it to uh, your team uh, and I will get the um, correspondence as well. Uh, Jake, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I just wanna say, I know you have to depart there, Sven. Uh, thank you very much for making time. We definitely will follow up in due time. Um, and the other thing is we are gonna stay on this call for our members here yep. and take any notes, comments or suggestions so we can frame it uh, in regards to us being able to advocate on your behalf. So, um, you know, as much as, as, as I know Sven has to run, we're gonna stay on for till the last person needs to be heard. On the Perfect. We'll stay on. And Jake, maybe just to, just to repeat the point, uh, really the fact that the OBIAA is in poor credit is useful. And if, if Kay says, you know, I'm hearing this from 300 other BIAs mm -hmm. and she brings this forward as one submission to the finance minister in the course of the context of the current pre-budget consultations, that will have impact. There's no question. So please uh, don't hesitate to use that relationship. Thank you. We Thanks, will. everybody. We'll talk again soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Um, yes, hello, everybody. We were going to kind of end the, end the meeting at uh, 1230, but I know a few people might want to have any questions or comments that we as the BIA could take note of. Um, and that way we can kind of uh, better prepare to advocate on your behalf. So if you have any questions directly for us, what we're doing, how we could improve, what you need more of, please, now's your chance. We'll, we'll stay on a little longer to, to hear from you, okay? And if I could just chime in, there was just a couple of comments that uh, maybe I can help a little bit with. Uh, if I can. Uh, so I just, uh, one of them was uh, was from Julia, and that was just getting some better guidance and some more clarity. And, uh, and this is, this is, again, what, what I keep pushing for. Um, and, you know, the fact that we don't have it yet, I think is just beyond wrong. Uh, because when, uh, when the new, uh, when the new measures were came down from Dr. Lowe, and, uh, and from the province, I asked for a simple one pager to be distributed to everybody so that we're, so that everybody knows what's going on. Uh, if you re any, any time things had changed before, uh, I get that I've had that done and I keep asking for that and I get that sent out to the BIA for, for distribution. Haven't received it yet. So I'm gonna be on them again to, to have something for a little bit more clarity so people know what's happening. Uh, and then Jonathan as well, uh, was uh, was wondering uh, or asking about authority in terms of uh, shutting things down and things of that nature. Uh, the uh, the two, uh, I guess the, the the way the way that it works, it's uh, uh, the Dr. Lowe, our chief medical officer at the region. Um, he gives advice to the province, and then the province makes a determination uh, which way to take it. So it, it was. Uh, some of the measures that were done was with his recommendation so it, it was not it was not the mayor per se uh in terms of uh, who has that authority it's uh it's those uh, it really it comes down from the province but um so i just wanted to uh, to let you all uh, know that um that i as i mentioned in my earlier comments um i I, I hear you loud and clear. And, and again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, if you're going to take out a bazooka and shoot it at something, shoot it at something that that makes sense. And, um, and so uh, having uh, having restaurants and local businesses and shops that are doing everything that they're supposed to do as being the scapegoat, I, I don't think is, uh, is right or appropriate. And uh, so I'm going to be uh, on that again, we have a re we have a city council tomorrow. Uh, and there's a COVID section there, I'll be bringing that up. And then there's regional council on Thursday, and I'll be uh, certainly bringing that up with Dr. Lowen. So stay tuned. As soon as I hear anything new, uh, I always pass things down, whether it's daily case counts, etc. I always pass it down through uh, through the BIA uh, to get circulated to uh, to everybody in the membership. Thank you, Stephen. How can we get how can we get the strong statement coming from Oakville when they are going to impose rules and restrictions a few weeks ago? The Brampton mayor is echoing what we're saying. How can we get our mayor, which it is disappointing that, 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 sh that she did not take the same route as Patrick Brown. And Patrick Brown is saying what we're saying. 
if there was the issues within the, the industry that's getting crippled the most, we would be the first ones to say, we better shut these down. We better have really strict restrictions. We would be the first ones, but that's not the case. And so um, it's very disappointing, you know, that that uh, Mayor Crombie did not take a strong stance like the Mayor of Oakville and the Mayor of Brampton. I, I don't mean to pass the buck by any stretch. It's uh, I, I just don't want to speak for uh, for the mayor because, uh, again, um, you know, put it yeah. this way. She knows she knows my thoughts loud and clear uh, as, as I've had these conversations directly with her. So um, that's something that I think we you know, it's it's good. Uh, I, my my in my opinion, Jake. It's um, as chair of the BIA. I think it's uh, it's well worth having that conversation with her. And if you uh, if you need any help in terms of setting that up or whatever, I'm happy to do it. Thank you. Not not meaning to put you in the spot, but but advocating does work. Yeah. Okay. And, and I do know that Halton would be different. Their case counts are substantially different than than ours. Um, when it comes to Brampton, yeah, I, I that's a real head scratcher because, quite frankly, um, whether people want to admit it or not, and it might not be the most politically correct thing to say, but uh, the reality is uh, our our case count numbers uh, are really getting driven substantially by Brampton, and um, and and for in my opinion. You know, uh, the province didn't want uh, Mississauga to separate, but you know, in this type of situation, uh, to be able to uh, to to untangle uh, the region, um, you know, quite frankly, Caledon and Mississauga are are paying the price for uh, a lot of what we're seeing in Brampton, uh, albeit the Mississauga numbers have gone up uh, a fair bit in the past three to three to five days. Uh, but reality is um, a lot of the drivers uh, is Brampton. And, and I, I think, you know, we all recognize that. Okay. Does anybody else have anything to add? Uh, I do, Matina Elsie. Stephen, um, what, can be, what can be done? Like, can, can we request a meeting with Dr. Lowe or somebody from public health to go through the numbers and explain them to us and the rationale so that we can at least understand his decision or his somebody from his team to, to um, because what's happening now is they're, they're losing, they're losing the support of the public that they're, they're, the public's no longer afraid and the public doesn't believe the numbers and the public is no longer changing. And so um, it's a real issue that they're saying all this stuff. Like for example, people coming into our restaurants still don't even know we have to close at nine. And they're like, nine, when did that happen? What's that? Like, so the messaging coming is not, is not being heard by the, a lot of the public because other than the small businesses that are being affected by this, who do pay attention, a lot of a lot of the public is not paying attention, and they are not changing their habits because they don't believe that there's a real risk. I, I think you bring up a, you bring up a good point, which I will bring up uh, I will bring up with Dr. Lowe um, during council sessions and seeing if. Uh, you know, my, my recommendation is, uh, is if he can participate in, in a forum like, like that's happening now, or uh, quite frankly, if there's an appetite, uh, you know, at the city uh, that, that Dr. Lowe would do um, uh, one of these virtual town halls with, uh, you know, uh, on a broader basis. But, uh, but I, I agree with you, you know, go right to the horse's mouth, right? I think it's worth uh, raising the issue with uh, the region of Peel Health that um, when there's no basis for uh, the extra measures put on restaurants, bars, gyms, and a couple of other types of institutions. And, you know, we always refer to things province wide, region wide. Well, everything is different in different pockets, as you said, mentioned, Stephen. The numbers are far higher in Brampton than they are in other parts of Mississauga. And I can't imagine they're that high down here. Um, and you know, what I think it was Carter and Matina raised, I've heard as well from people, 
you know, when they're, when they're shut down at nine o'clock, they're, they're all getting together to go to somebody's house and you can be damn sure that they're not, you know, wiping things down and they're not social distancing and they're not wearing masks in a lot of cases. Right. So, you know, at least when you have that third party policing people, they're forced to adhere to the protocols that have been put in place. Whereas if they're left to their own devices, in many cases, that's not what's happening. So, you know, there are some who are very careful but there are others who clearly have not been throughout this pandemic you know and it's and it's you know effectively punishing the people that have taken the measures put some extra money into the business to make sure that they're able to follow the protocols and uh be attentive to what's going on in their establishments i've been out to a few restaurants in support and I've never seen any violation in any one of the restaurants. People get up from their from their seats, they go to the washroom, they put on their mask. You know, people are not getting close together. You know, you've got groups at tables, they're not raucous, they're out just, you know, having a conversation, having a good time. And, you know, I mean, I think it's it's very difficult for the people that have followed the 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 protocol since the very beginning to be subjected to this again, you know, which is just killing them. I mean, some of these businesses are not gonna be around. Anyway, that's my two cents. If I may, essentially what this nine o'clock curfew has done is I believe in a curfew. I believe after, and I've always said it, I've been in the industry 25 years, nothing good happens after midnight. But the, the 11 o'clock curfew I get, they get their last call, they go, 90% of them go home. It's midnight, they're, they go home. Now, essentially what you're doing or what they're doing is before you used to go, before COVID, you used to go to someone's house to pre-drink before you went out to have a good time. Now they're coming to our establishments to pre-drink, to go home, to par now party or be, you know, 25 year olds are not going home at nine o'clock. I don't care what anybody says. They are now gathering in each other's homes and they're making it worse. And this is why the numbers have spiked in the past four days, because now you're forcing them to go other places to continue socializing. They're not going in people's backyards and building fires. They're not standing around nine feet apart, singing kumbaya to one another. They're having their meal in our restaurant and they're leaving and they're going home and sitting in someone's living room, 10 to 15 of them. And this is exactly why the numbers have spiked. They need to reverse it and allow us to be the policing, allow us to monitor them, allow us to be the people to come to have a safe evening out. And then they're gonna go home at 11 o'clock and so be it. Very true, very true. Uh, Shannon Donnelly, I think you said you had something to say. Shannon? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I still don't have video on this uh, this thing. Um, basically, Kara, you basically took all, all the words out of my mouth that I wanted to say, so thanks for that. Um, but a big, big thing, that a big challenge that we're finding is we are constantly educating our customers, whether they're phoning to make a reservation, um, letting them know, you know, it's only four people from your household at a table or letting them know that, sorry, you can't come in at nine o'clock. You can come in at eight o'clock for your dinner. Um, you have to wear a mask, you, you know, all these, these restrictions that were put to us, we're educating them. There needs to be more information out there for the general public. Um, it's, it's just the, you know, looking at our servers, they have enough to do and adding more and more, I get it but they the general public still need to be educated um and that's something that we're finding is hard uh and the same thing is what was said earlier with the last minute restrictions so on a monday we can be told as of friday these are the restrictions so we prepare our staff we prepare the products that we're purchasing uh we get everything ready for friday and then on late thursday afternoon it's all reversed so what happens to all that product well we try and salvage as much as we can or we cook off a bunch of stuff and we send it out to the compass or to another to another area to our staff um calling off the staff they're on a yo-yo effect right now and it is hurtful it's hurtful to do that to any human um we have a great staff they're fully understandable but it does take its toll staff morale is at the worst it's ever been i've been in this industry 26 years this is the first that we've all seen of this but the morale, it, it kills me to see it like this. And I'm sorry that Tommy's not here, but to see him after working so hard all these years is just gut-wrenching. He's the, most of you know him, he's the most positive person. 
when his positivity is gone, I feel like we have nothing left personally. So just a few things just to educate and to get um, the restrictions done and stuck to, because again, it's not the restaurants. Thank you, Shannon. Hi, um, I was told to take the floor next. So Shannon, I so totally feel yeah, what you're saying. Minute. Let me just say. Uh... Hello? Oh, sorry, go, go ahead. Me? Go ahead, Julia. I'll just uh, mute right here. <laughs> Danny's <laughs> muted, don't worry, go ahead. I feel, I 100% feel your point, Shannon, because like that's exactly what I, I was gonna comment on also. But um, the other thing that I wanted to, I have a comment and a question. So my comment is, is that even if we spend so much time educating our guests, so we're like, you know, we're doing all the cleaning, we're making all the TikToks, we're doing all the videos, we're like being as marketing like savvy as we can and like trying to get out there and like get everyone like rally that it's okay to come out, we are safe, we're socially distancing. And then these things, you know, come at the last minute and contradict us. And then there's no recovery from that. So like I have bookings that get canceled at the very last minute because people don't know what to do and whether to go, oh, I don't know if I should go out. Cause like, I have this person in my home and stuff. And like, I understand them, they're scared. I have no answer to them. And then I just end up losing out business and I have no idea. And so I guess my next question is given that there's new regulations that are coming at us at the very last minute effective on Friday, of which we have events planned and I'm expecting cancellations. What are the uh, repercussions of continuing with business? Like, are we supposed to close? Um, do we get audited? Um, you know, we're trying to get our clients out by, uh, stop serving alcohol by nine and get our clients out by 10. We freak out the entire time. We're like, oh my God, we have to like get the bills cashed out at nine. And then we have to push them out of the door at 10 and they're finishing their paintings. like what what do we do and like what are the restrictions like what are the what do we do as a friday <laughs> i need that question answered yeah julia you know all i all i can say is uh, that's part of what i'm asking for and i'm hoping to get that in terms of like a one page or like you know they, they come out with these things and expectations it's uh, I, I know one of the others was um you know with the uh, with the early closure for example that you know the uh, the 10 p.m closure and you got to be out by 11 uh, and and then hearing from um from nina and others that all it was doing was pushing people out onto lakeshore uh, and uh, and and you would just end up with a whole mob of people in an unstructured uh, environment outside like that made uh, absolutely no sense uh, either so yeah i'm, I'm trying to get some more clarity for everybody just one more quick point i also like i'm noticing like a lot of people in my network or stuff like that like i see my clients and guests that i follow very closely and they're all going out for dinner in oakville and hamilton and they're going to niagara falls and they're all having a great time and like you know we're all sitting here with no clients absolutely i i, I had a i had a, a resident want to uh, take me out for breakfast and offered to take me to Oakville. And, uh, and I, I promptly said not a chance, but you know, it, it's that kind of stuff. So I, I, I totally hear you. Um, one thing I do have to say is I have a one o'clock appointment right now uh, in terms of uh, another uh, WebEx or virtual call, whatever. So if maybe I could just take a, one or two more comments and then I really unfortunately have to go. I have a quick question, Stephen, if I can. Yeah, sure, Nina. Okay, just curious. Um, uh, I know John, Jake, and myself, we have been spending a lot of time brainstorming different ways how we can uh, have our concerns and our voices heard. We talked about hosting a mini rally, but then we were basically told if you do this, you could potentially face a fine of $25,000 plus a fine for each attendee. Um, you know, getting spent on a call took a great amount of time. You know, he says he wants to take our concerns and have our voices heard. How the hell do we do that? <laughs> you know, realistically, it took a long time to get him on here without collectively coming together and causing a scene. I don't understand how the human element of the situation is going to be relayed. So I'm, I, we're looking for suggestions, how our businesses can be heard and how we can continue to basically force our, our message and our concern to our politicians. Sorry, can I just add to that? 
because it, it's exactly what I was going to say. Um, I feel like getting Sven on took a little bit of a long, a longer time, which I understand his schedule is pretty busy. Um, and of all the businesses that are in poor credit, there's about 5% of us part of this call today. So it makes me wonder where the other 95% are. So I think if there's a, an effort that we can make, because I think there's a lot of effort being put out there, you know, with the, the bus wraps and the signs to get the public to visit our um, businesses. But I'm wondering if there's something that we can do as a group of small businesses in poor credit specifically that can get more people louder um, and heard so that we can get some of these things addressed on the federal level. And, you know, I, I just, I'm just surprised that there's so many businesses that are not part of this conversation. Steve, you know, yeah, I, I, I think that is a, you know, an issue as well. It's, um, and, and I think, you know, it, it's reflective and, you know, it's not say the BIA per se, it's with a lot of different organizations. It's, it's trying to get people to participate, but, uh, but it, honestly, it's, um, it's, it's getting a little bit creative too with, uh, with getting people's attention. Jake has done a phenomenal job uh, in terms of really rattling the cages to make sure that things are being heard. Um, and, and I think that's, that's, that's really uh, one part of it. The other part is, uh, is, you know, encourage everybody to send an email, to make a phone call, to call, to call Rudy, to call Sven, uh, to call my office, to call the mayor's office, uh, you know, like just keep, that going because that's really important. The BIA has been a strong advocate and continues to be, uh, but the more voices heard, the better. Uh, I'll, I'll be very honest. Um, and, uh, and as I mentioned, I will be bringing forward, uh, you know, some of, some of this conversation uh, tomorrow and also on, on, on Thursday. But um, uh, no, I, I, I completely hear you, and uh, that that is the issue. You know, you, you go to do a rally, and uh, and and then you're capped with you know uh, with, with numbers, right, and, and things like that. So, it's um, unprecedented time that, that we're in, and uh, and that's why you know using some of these things that we have available is uh, is is what we need to do. Uh, but also, one thing I am going to ask for is if we might be able to do a virtual call with uh, with Dr. Lowe, uh, for example, and um, you know. I think that that might be uh, another approach to take just to uh, get him to explain where he's coming from and also let him know where everybody is coming from. That's uh, that's that's a local business owner and, and knowing what measures are going in to um, to all of this. You know, it's, uh, you know, having somebody that's not making any revenue to go out and then spend thousands of dollars on uh, on keeping people safe just to be turned around and told to shut down is uh, is, is outrageous. So, um, they, you know, let, let me see if I might be able to organize something like that as well. Thank you, Steve. I'm just going to touch on uh, before you leave. Um, thank you very much because I'm sure everyone knows that not only the council, but you are a, a board member of the BIA and, and having that direct pipeline to the city really helps. And you've been a champion of supporting the businesses down here. You live in the community, you're part of the community. So really got to thank you for, for <laughs> the response and everything that you do. So um, the people are, the, the businesses are people campaign is a, a foundation of our advocacy. Since we cannot host a rally, which we are planning on trying to do this week, we we're gonna have something starting from the lighthouse and going to where the pork credit sign was and just to raise awareness in a safe manner to get the attention. But we're gonna to have to um, rally behind the businesses or people. It's not just a video that we showed earlier. It's gotta be more of a stronger campaign to advocate for the small business community, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna keep ramping that up even more. So stay tuned, everybody, about that. So um, thank you, Councillor Daskos. So and if anybody else has any questions uh, after he leaves, feel free to to jump in. Have a have a good rest of the day, everybody, and and thanks again. Take thank care. you, Stephen. Everybody, stay on. really let it fly now.
Okay, does anybody else have anything that they would like to add? I do. Any? Yes, please go ahead, John. Okay, so now we have to identify what the real enemy is here. <clears throat> and we all have to stick together. What really happened is that we lobbied hard and we flipped Mayor Crombie, we flipped Brown, we flipped Tory. And last week they were all saying, let's get restaurants open. Uh, Ford was happy to hear that. My brother talks to Ford. And uh, basically they were saying, oh, let's get have open doors policy. Heard Tory last week, we have to have an open doors policy, all this bull. And that was on Monday, we finally convinced them to uh, let us open, right? And then by Friday, what happened is the Ontario Hospital Association wrote very strong letters saying that they were being reckless. And then William Osler Hospital wrote a letter and then Trillium wrote a letter. So what's happened here is that the lobby of the hospitals and the medical community has way stronger voice than ours. And it is their recommendation that we close because they think we're the problem. Okay, so I've talked to people who know and they're basically like, they're very strong. They control a lot of votes and they have a lot of ear for the government. So this is a huge mountain to climb. So it's my opinion that things are only gonna get worse and we're gonna only get more lockdown. Lobbying to get less lockdown right now, I think is unrealistic. So I think what we should lobby for the most is give us some money, right? The stupid cap on the wage subsidy is crushing. Like, let's face it, we wouldn't all be crying here if they actually paid us our wage and, and a wage of our staff, you know? Yeah, we'll close. You want us close? We'll close. Just pay us. That's my two cents. Very true, John. Um, anybody else want to jump in there for any comments? Arun? We're good. Okay, well, on that note, um, go ahead. Thank you everyone, for Care BIA especially, to support us in this difficult time. We have been getting support from you guys from all the way starting this pandemic. And now we need your support more than ever as cases are going up and we are getting the information. We cannot serve the drinks inside. We can do that. And also as we are just around the corner to the boundary for the Port Cat BIA, we feel kind of isolated and we are looking for your support as a neighboring business. We are very overwhelmed the support you guys have been doing to us. And thank you so much for supporting us. That's all thank you thank you Arun. keep keep sticking in sticking in there and doing the best you can i think the the other takeaway too is uh we're all entrepreneurs we're all business owners and we all support each other at the end of the day we truly are all in this together okay um unfortunately not like i said earlier not not the ones that are that get paid every two weeks and and don't have to have this insurmountable debt and despair because they still get Politicians still keep getting paid every two weeks. So we have to keep hitting them hard um, professionally, but keep hitting them hard. Yeah. On that note, um, we're gonna we're gonna uh, we're gonna end the uh, the session today. We promise you we will uh, follow up with another meeting in, in months time or a few months. Um, please keep uh, sharing our posts. We want to get more followers on our social media. The more people we have, the more we can advocate. More people hear our voice as small business owners. Thank you so much. Business is our people. You got it. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Way to go. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you, everybody.